Six of Crows, Chapter 10, Inej. Over the next day, Inej saw Kaz begin to move the pieces of his scheme into position. She'd been privy on his consult consultations with every member of the crew, but she knew she was seeing only fragments of his plan. That was the game Kaz always played. If he had doubts about what they were attempting, it didn't show, and Inej wished she shared his certainty. The ice court had been built to withstand an onslaught of armies, assassins, Grisha, and spies. When she'd said as much to Kaz, he'd simply replied, but it hasn't been built to keep us out. His confidence unnerved her. What makes you think we could do this? There will be other teams out there, trained soldiers and spies, people with years of experience. This isn't a job for trained soldiers and spies. It's a job for thugs and thieves. Vanek knows it, and that's why he brought us in. You can't spend his money if you're dead. I'll acquire expensive habits in the afterlife. There's a difference between confidence and arrogance. He turned his back on her then, giving each of his gloves a sharp tug. And then I want a sermon on that. I know who to come to. If you want, just say so. Her spine had straightened, her own pride rising to her defense. Matthias isn't the only irreplaceable member of this crew, Kaz. You need me. I need your skills, Inej. That's not the same thing. You, may be, you may be the best spider crawling around the barrel, but you're not the only one. You do well to remember that if you want to keep your share of the hall. She hadn't said a word, hadn't wanted to show just how angry she, he'd made her, but she'd left his office and hadn't said a thing to him since. Now she was headed toward the harbor. She wondered what kept her on its path. She could leave Kirch any time she wanted. She could sail away on a ship bound for Noviazem. She could go back to Ravka and search for her family. Hopefully they'd been safe in the West when the Civil War broke out, or maybe they'd been taken refuge in Chuhan. The Sully caravans had been following the same well-worn roads for years, and she had the skills to steal what she needed to survive until she found them. That would mean walking out on her debt to the dregs. Per Haskell would blame Kaz. He'd be forced to carry the price of her indenture, and she'd be leaving him vulnerable without his wraith to gather secrets. But hadn't he told her that she was easily replaced? If they managed to pull off this heist and return to Kirch with Bullyo Bayer safely in tow, her percentage of the hull would be more than enough to buy her way out of her contact with, with the dregs. She'd owe Kaz nothing, and there would be no reason for her to stay. Sun Eyes was only an hour away, but the streets were crowded as she wandered, as she wended her way from the east to the west dave. There was a Sully saying, The heart is an arrow. It demands aim to land true. Her father had liked to recite this when she was training on the wire or the swings. Be decisive, he'd say. You have to know where you want to go before you get there. Her mother had laughed at this. That's not what that means, she'd say. You take the romance out of everything. He hadn't, though. Her father had adored her mother, and Ed remembered him leaving the little bouquets of wild geraniums for her mother to find everywhere, in the cupboards, the camp cook pots, the sleeves of her costumes. Shall I tell you the secret of true love? Her father once asked her. A friend of mine liked to tell me that women love flowers. He had many flirtations, but he never found a wife. Do you know why? Because women may love flowers, but only one lo loves the scent of gardenas in the late summer that remind her of a grandmother's porch. Only one woman loves apple blossoms in a blue cup. Only one woman loves a wild geranium. That's Mama, Inej had cried. Yes, Mama loves wild geraniums because no other flower has quite the same color, and she claims uh, when she snaps the stem and pulls, puts a spring behind her ear. The whole world smells like summer. Many boys will bring you flowers, but someday you'll meet a boy who will learn your favorite flower, your favorite song, your favorite sweet, and even if he is too poor to give you any of them, it won't matter because he will have taken the time to know you as no one else does. Only that boy earns your heart. That felt like a hundred years ago. Her father had been wrong. There had been no boys to bring her flowers, only men with stacks of kruga and purses of full of coin. Would she ever find see her father again? Her mother singing, listen to her uncle's silly stories. I'm not sure that I have a heart to give anymore, Papa. The problem was that Inej was no longer certain what she was aiming for. When she'd been little, it was e it had been easy. A smile from her father. The tightrope raised another foot. Orange cakes wrapped in white paper. When it had been getting free of Tantaline and the menagerie, that and after that surviving each day, getting a little stronger with every morning. But now she didn't know what she wanted. Just this minute, I'll settle for an apology, she decided, and I won't be bored the boat without one. Even Kaz isn't sorry, he can pretend. He at least owes me the best imitation of a human being. If she hadn't been running late, she would have looped around West Ave or simply traveled over rooftops. That was the Ketterdam she loved, empty and quiet, high above the crowds, a moonlit mountain range of gabled peaks and off-kilter chimneys. But to the night, she was short on time. Kaz had sent her scouring the shops for two lumps of paraffin at the last minute. She wouldn't even tell her, he wouldn't even tell her they were for or why they were so necessary. And snow goggles? She'd had to visit three different outfitters to acquire them. She was so tired, she didn't entirely trust herself to make the climb over the gables, not after two nights without sleep and a day spent wrangling supplies for the trek to the ice court. She posed, she supposed she was daring herself to. She never walked West Dave alone. With the dregs at her side, she could stroll by the menagerie without a glance toward the golden bars on the windows. But tonight, her heart was pounding, and she could hear the roar of blood in her ears as she gilded. Fast came to into view. 
The menagerie had been built to look like a tired cage, a tiered cage. Its first two stories open, but for the widely spaced golden bars, it was also known as the House of Exotics. If you could taste for, if you had a taste for Shoe Girl or Fjarden Giant, a redhead from the Wandering Isle, a dark-skinned Zemini, the menagerie was your destination. Each girl was known by her animal name: leopard, mare, fox, raven, ermine, f- fawn, snake. Suli Sears wore the jackal mask when they piled her shade and looked into a person's fate. But what man would want to bed a jackal? So the Suli girl and the menagerie always stalked Suli girl was known as the lynx. Clients wouldn't come looking for girls themselves, just brown suey skin, the fire of Kalish hair, the tilt of golden shoe eyes. The animals remained the same, though the girls came and went. And Nedge glimpsed peacock feathers on in the parlor, and her heart stuttered. It was just a bit of decoration, part of a lavish flower arrangement, but the panic inside her didn't care. It rose up, clutching at her breath. People crowded in all in on all sides, men in masks, women in veils, or maybe they were men in veils and women in masks. It was impossible to tell. The horns of the imp, the goggling eyes of the madman, the sad face of the, sher- of the scarab queen wrought in black and gold. Artists loved to paint the scenes of the West Day of the boys and girls who worked the brothels, the pleasure seekers, dress as characters from the comedy brute. But there was no beauty here, no real merriment or, or joy, just transactions, people seeking escape or some colorful oblivion, some dream of decadence that they would, that they could take from wherever they wished. Wished. Inej forced herself to look at the menagerie as she passed. It's just a place, she told herself. Just another house. How would Cass see it? Were there entrances and exits? How did the locks work? Which, uh, which windows were unbarred? How many guards were posted? Which ones look alert? Just a house full of locks to pick, safes to crack, pigeons to do. And she was a predator now. Not Helene and her peacock feathers. Not any man who walked these streets. As soon as she was out of sight of the menagerie, the tight feeling in her chest and throat began to ease. She'd done it. she walked alone on the West Dave, right in front of the House of Exotics. Whatever was waiting for her in Fjarda, she could face it. A hand hooked around her forearm and yanked her off her feet. Inej regained her balance quickly. She spun on her heel and tried to pull away, but the grip was too strong. Hello, little lynx. Inej hissed a breath and tore her arm free. Taunt Helene. That was what her girls knew to call Helene Van Hooden or risk the back of her hand. To the rest of the barrel, she was a peacock, though Inej had always thought she looked less like a bird than a preening cat. Her hair was thick and luscious gold, her eyes hazel and slightly feline. Her tall, sinuous frame was draped in vibrant blue silk and pulgy neckline, ascended with iridescent feathers that tickled the signature diamond choker glittering at her neck. Inej turned to run, but her path was blocked by a huge bruiser. His blue velvet coat stretched tight across his big shoulders. Cobbit, Helene's favorite enforcer. Oh no, you don't, little lynx. Inej's vision blurred. Trapped, trapped, trapped again. That's not my name, Inej managed to gasp out. Stubborn thing. Helene grabbed the front, uh, grabbed hold of Inej's tunic. Move, her mind screamed. But she couldn't. Her muscles had locked up. A high whine of terror filled her head. Helene ran a single man, uh, manicure talon along her cheek. Lynx is your only name, Helene crooned. You're still pretty enough to fetch a good price. Getting harder on the eyes, though. Too much time spent with the little thug Brecker. A humiliating sound emerged from Inej's throat. A choked wheeze. I know what you are, Lynx. I know what you're worth down to the, down to the scent. Cobbit. Maybe she should take her home now. Maybe we should take her home now. Black crowded and in, crowded into Inej's vision. You wouldn't dare. The dregs. I can bide my, ti- my time, little lynx. You'll wear my silks again, I promise. She released the neige. Enjoy your night, she said with a smile, then snapped open her blue fan and whirled away into the crowd, Cobbett trailing after her. And as she stood frozen shaking, then she drove into, the, drove into the crowd eager to disappear. She wanted to break into a run, but she just kept moving steadily, pushing toward the harbor. As she walked, she released triggers on the sheaths at her forearms, feeling the grips of her daggers slide into her palms. Sankt Peter, renowned for his bravery, on the right, the slender, the bone-handled blade he named for Sancta Lina on the left. She recited the names of her other knives, too, Sancta Maria and Sancta Anastasia, strapped to her thighs, Sancta Vladimir hidden in her boot, and Sancta Elisabetta uh, snug in, at her belt, the blade etched in a pattern of roses. Protect me, protect me. She had to believe her saint saw and understood the things she did to survive. What was wrong with her? She was a wraith. She had nothing to fear from Tantaline any longer. Per Haskell had brought her out her indenture. He'd freed her. She wasn't a slave. She had a va- she was a valued member of the dregs, a thief of secrets, the best in the barrel. She hurried past the light and music of the lid, and finally the Ketterdam harbors came into view, the sights and sounds of the barrel fading as she neared the water. There were no crowds to bump against here for her, her f- here, so uh, no cloying perfumes or wild masks. She took a long deep breath. From its vantage, she could just see the top of one of the Tidemaker Towers, where lights always burned. The thick oblasks of the black stone were manned by night by a select group of Grisha who kept the tides permanently high over the land bridge and otherwise would ha- have connected Kirch to Shuhan. Even Kaz had never been able to learn the identities of the Council of Tides, where they lived, or how their loyalty to the Kirch had been guaranteed. 
They watched the harbors, too, uh, and if a signal went up from the harbor master or a dock worker, they'd alter the tides and keep anyone from hiding out to sea. But on this night, there wouldn't be there would be no signal. The right bribes had been paid for the right officials, and their ship would be, should be ready to sail. And Nez broke into a jog, heading for the lo- loading docks of Fifth, at Fifth Harbor. She was very late. She wasn't looking forward to Kaz's disapproving frown when she made it to the pr- pier. She was glad for the peace of the docks, but they seemed almost too still after the noise and chaos of the barrel. Here, the rows of crates and cargo containers were stacked high on either side of her, three, sometimes four, on top of one another. They made this part of the docks feel like a labyrinth. A cold sweat broke out at the base of her spine. The run-in with Aunt Helene had left her shaken, and the heft of the daggers in her hands wasn't enough to soothe her rattled nerves. She knew she should get used to carrying pistol, but the weight threw off her balance, and guns could jam her lock in a bad moment. Little links. Her blades were reliable, and they made her feel like she'd been born with proper claws. A light mist was rising off the water, and through it, Inej saw Kaz and the others waiting near the pyre. They all wore the nondiscreet clothes of sailors, rough spun trousers, boots, thick wool coats, and hats. Even Kaz had foregone the immaculatality cut suit uh, in favor of bulky wool coat. The thick sheaf of his dark hair was combed back, the sides trimmed short, as always. He looked like a dock worker or a boy setting sail on his first adventure. He was almost as if she were peering through a lens at some other, more pleasant reality. Behind him, she saw the little schooner Kaz had com- uh, commandeered, F- uh, Fjarolind, written in bold script on its side. It would fly the purple kerch fishes and the colorful flag of the Handrat Bay Company. To anyone in Fjarda or on the true sea, they would simply look like kerch trappers heading north for skins and furs. Nesh quickened her pace. If she hadn't been running late, they probably would have would been aboard, aboard or even on their way out of the harbor already. They would keep a minimal crew, all former sailors who had made their way into the ranks of the dregs through one misfortune or another. Through the mist, she made a quick count of the waiting group. Their number was off. They brought in four additional members of the dregs to help sail the schooner since none of them really knew their way around the rigging, but she didn't see any of them. Maybe they're already on board. But even as she had that thought, her boot landed on something soft, and she stumbled. She looked down, the dim glow of the harbor sunlights. She saw Derex, one of the dregs who had been meant to make the journey with them. There was a knife in his ad- abdomen, and his eyes were glassy. Kaz, she shouted, but it was too late. The schooner exploded, knocking a nudge off her feet and showering the docks in flame.